Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another of our Discover Wildlife evenings. My name is Ian Lloyd. I'm one of the product managers here at Wildlife Wide and the Travelling Naturalist. This evening, I'm delighted to be joined by Mike Dilger for our Discover Scotland talk. Um, Mike, are you there? Um, Ian, I'm here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good to see you, Mike. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, um, I'm sure many of you will know Mike already, um, but for anyone that doesn't, um, Mike is one of our most popular tour leaders, um, an exceptional naturalist, um, broadcaster, author, um, and I know Mike leads trips all over the world for us, um, but he has a particular um, love for Scotland. Um, I'm not sure if it's the allure of um, uh, sought after charismatic iconic species such as the Scottish midgey, or the fact that he can always guarantee Scotland's famous water wall sunshine on his trips. Um, but we're in for a treat tonight as we hear all about Scotland. Um, as ever, there will be the opportunity to ask questions throughout and at the end of the talk, and we will try to get through as many of those as we can this evening. Um, please use the Q&A function uh, to pose any questions and We'll also have a poll at the end of the talk where there'll be the opportunity to request a travel plan for various Scottish trips that Mike will be discussing this evening. So if you're ready, Mike, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Ian. When you did your introduction there, you also forgot to mention you're my boss. So I'll have to be <laughs> my best behaviour tonight. Um, hello to everyone, uh, particularly my friends that I already know. Who might have been on a trip or two with me, uh, whether it be Space Lab, Shetland, Mole, Madagascar, or Ecuador to be, and those that I may well meet in the future. Absolutely delighted to do my second Zoom uh, going to one of the best places in the world, which is not Madagascar or Ecuador or Papua New Guinea. It's up north, it's Scotland. Um, I'm very lucky to have led loads and loads of trips with wildlife worldwide to Space Lab. Mull and Shetland and one or two other spots as well. And I'll be doing a whistle stop tour of all those with some sumptuous slides, some very sexy wildlife shots. And as Ian said, I'm more than happy to answer questions at the end. So without further ado, I've got one hour to go all the way around Scotland's highlands and islands. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll give it my very, very best shot. Um, for those of you who don't know me, frankly, you're a disgrace, because if you haven't kind of been uh, led by me at various trips, then you might have seen me on uh, The One Show, which I've been working on for 15 or 16 years now. I think it's been running 17 years, and I've done 15 of them all, 15 of them. And I am still doing One Show films, principally with my son. Um, is it Lord Shaftesbury, the one who, who stopped children going up chimneys? Well, I'm repealing those laws and I've got my boy working alongside with me doing a father and son combination as we travel around Britain looking at wildlife. So as well as, um, as Ian said, as well as the TV and the writing books and the tour leading. Um, yeah, I yeah, just do lots of things. I'm a professional plate spinner, really. Uh, and I just try to make sure that I don't smash too many plates. So here's me filming up on the Yorkshire Walls up to my breast in uh, in snow uh filming on the one show i've never actually been on a tour in scotland when it's been like that <laughs> perhaps if we went to the top of cairngorms um i might encounter that but generally we don't try to push you to the limit as most wonderful paid honored treasured guests clients whatever you will so there we go there's me um so principally um I, before i started working on the one show i used to work as a biologist in the tropics. Um, so I've worked in Ecuador and I'm also tour leading in Ecuador in April for a trip I think that's full. Uh, I've also worked in Vietnam and also in Tanzania. So there I am working all over uh, the tropics uh, as a biologist and then I get involved in television. Uh, this is a collector's item. It's me with a little bit of hair and a six pack. And I have neither of those things these days. Uh, that's when I was working out in Ecuador. Uh, just we talk about my favourite word in the world, biodiversity, coined by Ed Wilson, biological diversity, jamming two words together where you get species richness off the Richter scale. How many species of snake have we got in Britain? Three. How many am I holding there? Well, I've got a, pi I've got a, I've got a, a python around my neck 
I've got a rat snake in my left hand and I've got a fur de lance, the type of rattlesnake in my right hand. So that was me back in the day when I was Jungle Jim. Uh, but now I'm mostly, courtesy of The One Show, traveling all around the UK. Um, people think about natural history presenters, they think of Sir David Attenborough. And of course, he probably is the world's most traveled man, but he hasn't been to as many places around Britain as I have. There's hardly anywhere in this wonderful set of islands I've not been, either via television or via tour leading with Wildlife Worldwide. Um, so, for example, I was filming uh, on the Outer Hebrides a few years ago, and I went, I sailed past Barra, Benbeculus, South Uist, North Uist, Harris, Lewis, the monarchs inside, the shants, or sh monarchs outside, the shants inside, Sula Esker to the north, um, St Kilda off to the west, and I suddenly realised I've been to all of them. So I am very lucky to be able to travel all over and just basically watch wildlife all over Britain. So I'm going to start with the Whistlestock tour and start in the place that I know best next to my own back garden, which is Speyside. I recently calculated I've been up to Scotland over a hundred times and I probably spend about six or seven weeks a year in Speyside. I flipping love this place. Well, Speyside, of course, is, is the River Spey and it's all it's a massive river that rises way south from Monoliths and then comes right the way past Cairngorm and uh, past Granton on Spey, eventually coming out to the Murray Coast. So that whole area, the whiskey drinking area, is also a wonderful area for watching wildlife. I mean, it is genuinely one of the few places you can visit in Britain where you go away for a week and you are seeing different habitats every time. It's got forest, it's got mountains, it's got moorland, it's got lakes, it's got lochens, it's got the Murray Coast, so it's got estuary as well. I mean, it packs so much punch for a trip. So I really love spending time in Speyside. Um, the trips that I do, uh, I do at least four trips a year. I usually do uh, one in spring, one in summer, and a couple in autumn. I've just come back from two in autumn, which went really, really well. I was absolutely thrilled with how well they went. I've only been back, what, about a couple of weeks now. And we always stay at this hotel, the Grant Arms in Granton on Spey. Um, it's a wonderful old hotel. It is a unique hotel. It is the only genuine bespoke wildlife hotel in Britain. 90% of people who stay there are interested in wildlife. It's got in-house guides. It's got a library with wildlife books. It's got um, a lecture theater where they give wildlife lectures. Everything about this hotel breathes wildlife. So when you come and stay at the Grant Arms, for those who've been already, they know this, then you are you, you're amongst people like you. I mean, it's just a wonderful place to stay. I'm a best, I'm on, on great terms with, with all the stuff. I absolutely adore them. Um, they work really hard and they're really passionate about their wildlife and, and always asking us about what we've seen and where we've gone and what we're gonna to do tomorrow. So it's an absolutely belting place to stay. Um, right on the doorstep is the most enormous uh, Caledonian forest. Of course, the Caledonian Scots pine forest is only 1% of the original forest cover is left. But most of that 1% is around Granton on Spey, where we stay, and also Avimore, further down the road. And that's Pinus sylvestris, the Scots pine you can see. And if you look below, you can see juniper, heather, bilberry, or as the Scots call it, blaberry. And this is the habitat for, for things like pine martins, crested tits, all manner of other birds, uh, and, and great mammals as well. Um, so um, the forest, of course, is not just on space side. There's big pine forests near the Murray coast due north. So not only do I take people like you away to space side, I also take my family. And this is my boy being like a, a, a pine ninja up the tree. So you can also get crested tit on the coast as well. So if we miss it in Speyside, we'll get it there. And this is the bird that most people want to go for. So I sound like a real smarty pants because I go, crested tit coming. And you're like, what, 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 where is it? Where is it? What is it? Is it coming? Uh, because everybody wants to see this little punk bird with its cool crest. And once you, it's a really noisy, pugnacious little bird, a bit like the blue tit. Or like the kingfisher, the kingfisher always goes, does that tinny whistle, which means I'm coming, I'm coming, look at the river, I'm about to fly past. And the crested tit, when it comes down to the feeder, does this trill, 
So I go, crest the incoming, crest the incoming, and usually they fly down. I love that dry trill. When you get in, you ear in, it's really distinct. So we go to show people the crest is at somewhere like um, Loch Garten, which is a fantastic site, or nearby. But Loch Garten's the best place in many ways because we show people crest is, and then we say, you can also hold your hand out and put some seed on. And the cold tits come down. We had a record of four cold tits in one hand recently, and they're brilliant. So you can even do stupid things like this. And I, all I'm saying is, that's a tit and it's on a head, and I'll let you draw your own conclusions. So, I mean, quite often we'll show the crested tit and then people get to feed the cold tit and, and it just it's wonderful having the bird land on your hand. It's like a delightful mugging. They're just such enchanting creatures. And I don't know anywhere else where cold tits come to the hand other than Loch Garten. So yeah, cresties and feeding the tits, it's a, it's a good reserve for that. Uh, mammals, I mean, a lot of people want to see the birds, uh, the feathers, and I'm probably best known for looking at feathers, but there's some pretty cool fur up there as well. Certainly the red squirrel, any squirrel you see in Speyside will be a red one. If there's a grey one there, that's bad news because it shouldn't be there. Someone's obviously released it out of a bag or something. There's only red squirrels. Um, I don't think I've had a single week where I haven't seen a red squirrel. I never like to use the G word, guarantee. But usually if we work hard enough, we'll find these little cheeky beggars coming down to feeders or running around the tops of the trees. Um, they are smaller. They are gingery. They are cute and endearing. And it's just an absolutely brilliant animal to catch up with. So Cresty and Red Squirrel are definitely two forest animals that we really will be gunning for at Speyside. Um, probably the, the mammal that most people want to see is the Pine Martin. Now, during our Speyside week, apart from the summer trip, because summer's obviously very, um, the, the, the long summer days mean we don't go into the height then, but certainly in spring and autumn trips, we will book a hide visit where we're guaranteed badgers. The badgers always come in. And I'm on about 50% for Pine Martin. They're not guaranteed. Um, but with a bit of luck, we will get the we'll get the Pine Martin coming down. And it's absolutely fantastic when they when they come down to the feeders there. Uh, we, we've got a, feeding, a place that we use just south of Avimore. We have an exclusive use of the hide. So we get in there, get ourselves comfortable, um, and then just wait to see what turns up. So when a pine martin comes out, it is a red letter day. So yeah, definitely be looking for pine martins up in Speyside. I have actually seen them during the day as well. Uh, when I was doing a trip in the summer, we had a pine martin that um, I almost ran over. And the, three, the two guests in the front saw it, and plus a guest who turned around to ask me a question saw it. Everybody else missed it. That's the way it goes. Some you win, some you lose. So obviously spring and autumn for the pine martins, but one of my favorite trips is leading in the summer. And obviously you don't get the winter wildfowl and the geese, and you, 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 know, you probably won't see the, we don't go into the hide, but I love it in the summer, those long summer evenings. And Ian talked about midges. It's nowhere near as midgy as you think. It's far worse on the West Coast. So I love going in the summer, um, kind of end of June, beginning of July. That's when you get Slavonian grebe in full summer plumage. That's when you get ospreys fishing. You still get the chance to see things like golden eagles and white-tailed eagles and all the specialist stuff that you want to see. But then you get a chance to see some of the Caledonian flowers. This is um, Linnea borealis, or twin flower, which is Carl Linnaeus, who's the modern father of nomenclature, the Swedish taxonomist, naturalist, who came up with a binomial nomenclature of phylum class, family, order, genus, species. This was his favourite flower. And the only place you can see it in Britain is under the, uh, under the Caledonian Scots pines uh, in June, July. And it's just an absolutely belting plant. Um, this is my own picture. So some of my own pictures aren't quite as good as some of the other ones that people like my friend Nick Garber has taken. Uh, this is coal root orchid. I once heard orchids described as honorary mammals because they're so sexy. They're just too sexy to be plants. I personally flipping love plants. But you want to see coal root orchid. There are about two places in England. They're really, really hard to see. I think in Cumbria and possibly Teesdale. But if you go up to Scotland, I know exactly where they are. And we go into this amazing sphagnum boggy forest. 
and seeing Colwood orchid is, is is beautiful. I love orchids. So um, in the summer trips as well, um, it, people love invertebrates too. Uh, the dragonflies and damselflies up there are wonderful. <clears throat> this is northern damselfly. So it's very pale pastel blue. And if you look, at the, there's the head, the thorax, and the long abdomen or tail. But if you look at the second abdominal segment, it's got like a little funny line on the side. And there's almost a mushroom on the at the bottom of the second abdominal segment. And that's the that makes it the northern damselfly. So we go for azure hawker, we go for white-faced darter, which is surely Britain's most beautiful dragonfly. Um, and also we'll go for the northern damselfly. So it's not just about feathers and fur, there's some cool inverts too. Um, so forest, we talked about mountains and moorland. And of course, we're you know right next to the heart of the Cairngorms, the Cairngorms National Park. Uh, it doesn't have the highest mountain in Britain, of course, that's Ben Nevis, but it has eight out of the 10 highest mountains in Britain within its range. The only one that's not, apart from Ben Nevis, is Ben Laws, which is the famous botanical site uh, in Perthshire, further south. But the mountains are wonderful. This is um, over towards uh, higher up on the River Spey where we get looking for red deer. So the moorland, uh, as, as well as the mountain, are fantastic, principally for, for this beast, the monarch of the Glen, Edwin Lancier's famous portrait of a stag with 12 points. So six points on each or six times. So you've got bow bay tray for the, for the forward spike and the two sideways spikes. And if you've got three in the cup, that makes it a royal stag. If you go to somewhere like Wimbledon Common, you can see 20 pointers which is cheating really, because up in Scotland on the moorland, it's a hard life. It's tough to kind of survive up there. So if you see a 12 points, you do really well. And I just came back uh, from the trip in autumn and in the October trips, we get a chance not only to see the red deer really well with a full rack of antlers, you get a chance to hear them and they go, <laughs> while they're gathering their harems together. So we were looking for golden eagles and, um, and, and hen harriers and just heard this echoing around the hillside. I mean, if, if that sound has been in, in Scotland, in the highlands of Scotland for tens of thousands of years, it's a primeval sound. And it, you, know, you know you're in a special place at a great time of year when you hear red deers roaring. I mean, and they offer great photographic opportunities for people who like to snap pics as well. Look at that, what an absolutely handsome beast. He really is. Uh, carrying on with the moorland theme, um, there's obviously four species of grouse in Britain. Um, we've got a good chance of ptarmigan. Um, black capercaillie is just incredibly difficult. We're not allowed to actually guide for them, but we're in the right area, so we've always got a chance of seeing capercaillie. But we should get the two grouse. There's the red grouse, which is a beautiful sound. We have them walking. Uh, past us um, when we were up there last time. They've got these kind of white feathery feet, almost like those impressive sergeant major boots on um, on the parade ground. So looking for red grouse in this lovely heather moorland is, is great fun. Um, and this is probably my favourite place in Britain, apart from my own back garden. This is uh, Raptor Valley or Fintorn Valley. We always spend a day there. Usually I spend a day and a half. And for my money, this is the best place in Britain for raptors. We had a day apart, we had an exceptional day this year. We had 10 species of raptor golden eagle, white tailed eagle, hen harrier, peregrine, merlin, buzzard, sparrowhawk, kestrel, uh, and two more. I can't remember what they are. <laughs> anyway, we did blooming, blooming well. And this is the place I always go for golden eagles. A chance of white tailed eagles. Uh, good for Merlin, Buzzard, Red Kite as well was another one. So I'm just missing one. Oh, Gosshawk. Gosshawk was the other one we got. This is a really good site for Gosshawk. So if you like your birds of prey, Thintorn Valley is the place for you. There it is. I mean, I can't guarantee you won't see it as well as that, or you won't get it as close as that. I mean, I have had it really, really close. Sometimes it's a bit more of a very, very large dot on the horizon. But I, I was saying to Ian just before we started, I've never, ever failed to see a golden eagle on the space side trip. Sometimes it's been amazing. Sometimes it's been a bit less amazing. It's been quite remote. 
But that is our target, our big one target species down space side, the Goldie. I absolutely never get sick of seeing them. You can never see too many Goldies in your lifetime. So, I mean, I, just, I get excited every time I, I clap my eyes on one. So Golden Eagle is what we go for in Fintorn. Um, another um, animal we go for in Fintorn, although you can see them a variety of places. Uh, we did something different this year. We actually struggled to see them out in those during the day because they're still quite gray brown. So the color of heather, they're just starting to turn now to their lovely white color. This one's just coming over into its winter pelage. This is of course, is our only native lagomorph, our only native rabbit or hare. Um, so we went out for a night ride around the mall, a night drive, should I say, and managed to kind of catch up with two. And then we saw another one on the last day. So it's a really nice species. Sometimes we can get quite close if we're, if we're canny um, and just something you have to talk to it a little bit as you go up to it and not scare it too much. And you can get really nice pictures of it. So yeah, love looking for mountain hare, particularly in Fintorn and Loch and Daub and the areas around there. Talked about Loch and Daub. This is a really famous loch just north of Granton on Spey. Um, we always pop in here. This is a good place to look for red grouse. Uh, it's also a good place to look for golden eagle and things like stone chat, linnets, um, all manner of other moorland birds as well. But in the summer, it's the it's the one really well known and approachable area where you can see black throated diver. I mean, look at that. That is just that is just the most beautiful bird. I interviewed a chap called Stuart Ben, who works for the RSPB for the one show a few years ago, and he came out with this brilliant line saying it's an art deco bird. And it absolutely is. Um, if you come in the summer, they should look like this. And uh, but if you come if you want to come in March or autumn, they'll be in their winter plumage. But every single trip I've led, we've all we've had three species of diver: red throat, black throat, and great northern. And on one trip, we also had white bill diver, which was a lifer for me. So anyway, three species of diver uh, should get black throated diver. But only in summer will you see them looking, frankly, as gorgeous as that. Um, I love this bird. Oh, flipping heck, it's just an absolute bobby dazzler. Talking about the grouse, um, I know where three of the leks are up there. This is a black grouse. It's a lecking species, so principally in spring, not so much in summer, but certainly in autumn as well, they'll be lecking. Uh, or we go to early one morning and go and visit a lek. Um, and if the light's nice and it's a bit of a northerly wind, you can hear them. And so they display. I don't think the maximum I've had is about 13 males displaying. Uh, I filmed it for the one show and it went out early this year with me and my boy watching it. And a female came onto the leg, which was terrific. So this is a male and it just is a fantastic display where he drops his wings and shows those white studs on the leading edge. The lyre shaped tail spreads, that big white rosette of a bottom is shown and that beautiful red comb gets inflated. Um, in the summer, uh, we've only got one species of mountain butterfly. This is mountain ringlet. It's my, my photograph that was taken on a wildlife for wide trip. So a really, really good sight. I know we go right up into um, a little bit further south and um, Usually you have to hike or yomp for mountain ringlet, but I know a site that's probably about 50 yards from the road, which is always a bonus. If it turns a bit nasty, we can sit in the car and wait till the sun comes out because you really need sun to see this. So this is mountain ringlet. And here's my boy. Um, I've already talked about, for example, forests and mountains and more, for, sorry, found forests and moorland, but the Murray Coast is wonderful. You can see right up beyond my son and my dog, at Berg Head, right out on the point. Um, and we spend probably two days of each week on the Murray Coast, in the inner Murray Firth, and also working our way along the coast, looking for wildfowl waders, sea ducks, um, all manner of divers, all manner of exciting things. So um, in the inner uh, in Murray Firth, Channonry Point, the famous Channonry Point, that's the place that's during the summer best for seeing uh, bottlenose dolphins in the world. They come chasing the salmon as they move up into the firth. And quite often you can be on dry land on the point and get within 15, 20 meters of bottlenose dolphin jumping out the water. So certainly in the summer, this is a great site. 
Uh, we didn't have them last autumn, but we had um, Harbour Port Boys both times we were there. So, I mean, if you didn't miss the dolphins, you might get the Port Boys. Uh, the sea ducks are wonderful. This is long-tailed duck. We also get things like um, uh, scorp up there. So birds that are really, really hard to see down south. The winter, I mean, November now is a fun, October, November, December, January, February, March, are a wonderful time to see birds like this that are breed right up in the high Arctic. So they're kind of Newfoundland, they're Canada. I've seen these on their breeding grounds in Ellesmere Island, North Canada at 80 degrees north. So they're really far north and they come to spend the winter off the Moray coast. And by November, they will have molted into their full breeding plumage. And the males are stunning. They are the most beautiful dog, without a doubt. And this is another one that everyone likes to go for. This is Velvet Scoter. We had fantastic common scoters. I've never seen so many last time, the jet black bird with the yellow bill. But this is the, this is the one that's much more unusual with a little bit of white eyeliner and the white wing lining and a little bit more orangey than yellowy in the bill. So Velvet Scoter is always one we want to go for. Um, one thing we do is we also walk out into Fintorn Bay. We walk on water with Wildlife Worldwide. And I love walking out there because we get a chance to go right out there and see all the waders, all the wildfowl. I only ever go on the dropping tide so we won't get caught <laughs> just by having to run back for the, the tide starts to turn. So we do time it very, very carefully. And this shot was taken by me just about three weeks ago as we walked out and we were seeing this. All these pink footed geese coming all the way down from Spitsbergen. Beautiful. I'm suddenly aware of the fact I'm talking about space a lot. I will go to the location soon. Um, right up on top of the mountains. If we get a chance to in the summer, certainly not in the winter, we it, it, hopefully we might be able to go up on the funicular to look for ptarmigan. But when you go up there right to the summit, this is me near the summit of Cairngorm, plant spotting, walking up, you get a chance to look for snow buntings. This is in their winter plumage. In their breeding plumage, they are white with a little black, kind of little bits of black all over them. Uh, which, and and they've come down to the car park at the moment. Wonderful plants like starry saxifrage and trailing azalea. And obviously uh, really good views of, of ptarmigan last year when we walked up into the into the corries. So everyone wants to see a ptarmigan. You know, I mean, Montaigne, um, Montaigne member of the grouse family. So we just want to come to the end of Speyside. We spent a day on the West Coast. This is a picture I took two weeks ago. One of those panos you can do with your with your iPhone. And we're right over on the West Coast near Mellon Udrigal. And you can see right north towards Ullapool, all those mountains. There's Colmore there, Breriach, um, not the Breriach, um, uh, Antalach, and a few other really high mountains over on the West Coast. And we go over there because it's the best chance of white-tailed eagle, black-throated diver, great northern diver, and of course, looking for otters. But we got really good otter in the very last week, actually, on the on on uh, uh, on the Murray Coast. So we always look for otter when I'm over on the West Coast. Uh, great northern divers with their big double bump head, massive big bill, breed right in northern Canada, and we have them going calling with our their warbling call, um, just a fabulous bird to see. Right, without further ado, we're going on to Mull. Now I spend a week a year uh, on Mull, and it's just it's just the most amazing time. I, I work with um, a guy called Alexa Kershaw, who's a local guide there. I know Nick Baker does a week either before me or after me. So, I mean, you've got a couple of weeks to choose from when you want to go to Mull. And if you want to see eagles and you want to see otters, you've got to come to this place because it's just sensational. It's so compact and bijou. And we, we spend a couple of days out on the water. So if you like going on the water, we don't do that on the space side. If you want to get out on a boat, certainly Mull is probably the trip for you. Um, this is where we stay, Knock House. So we, we've got an exclusive. We completely take over the whole um, place we stay at, the, the whole of Knock House. All the staff are there for us. There's nobody else there who's not either working there or a guest for wildlife or wide or a guide. So it's a fantastic place to stay, just by Craig Muir. We've got a wonderful backdrop looking out to the sea. The food, I should say, is the best I've had anywhere. I would say Michelin starred. We have a, gay, a lady called Poppy 
who's been catering for us for the last three years, and the food is to die for. And we sit at this long, big table, get the wine out, and then the stories start about where everyone's been, where everybody wants to go, what we saw during the day. Um, it's a, just, I've had lots of fantastic conversations around that table. Love it to bits. And if you want to have a break, uh, it's just, um, uh, totally with Simon as well. There's a nice big snooker table. So I'll challenge anyone to a game of snooker or pull while you're there. So, I mean, there's nothing I won't do to, to please my co-guide. This is Alexa, who I co-lead when I'm up there. So I know my wildlife really well. She knows uh, mole really well, and she knows her wildlife pretty well as well. So between us, we've got it sewn up. When we have too many buses, you spend a day with me, and a day with Alexa, and then we switch over, and it works out brilliantly. And I just adore working with Alexa. She's my tour leading wife. She's fantastic fun. So yeah, the, the mole trips are always a great crack. Back at that, there you go. There's um, uh, it's Ben Moore, which is the only Munro uh, in, uh, in uh, Mull. And I've never been to the summit, actually. I must try and go at some point. But when you get a nice clear day, and believe me, you can get some wet days on Mull. I mean, I've had one week where it's rained a lot. And I've had one day where I've not seen a single drop of rain. So, I mean, it usually gets, it's a cure as egg. You know, you get a few sunny days, get a few wetter days, and we always, always make it work. But, um, you know, when you when you can see the summit of Colmore or Benmore, you know you're in for a good day. Um, but, you know, all these lovely crenulated coastlines and all these areas are absolutely brilliant for otters. So most of the roads that take you round Mull will take you along the road edge. So anyone who's on the left hand side or the right hand side needs to be constantly scanning the seaweed, looking for otters, because this is the one we want to see. Um, I've had some fantastic sightings of otters here. I mean, to get close, quite often we've got 12 people, 14 with the two guides, so we can't really go mon marching over slippery rocks. And um, and we don't. the last thing we want to do is disturb the otters uh, because we like to do these things ethically and leave the animal undisturbed. But quite often we get, we get loads of opportunities to take some nice pictures, uh, particularly if people have got longer lenses. And first and foremost, my trips are wildlife watching. So get the scope up and but, you know, get the fish, otter coming down with a going dive, comes up with a fish, comes off to dry land, eats the fish, and we just get a chance to fill our boots. So, I mean, otters and two species of eagle. I mean, we've got to be disappointed if we don't get a good sighting of otter during the week. Um, yeah. So, anyway, uh, lots of chance to kind of travel around and see beautiful areas around Mull. So, we'll spend a couple of days driving around Mull, the north part of the island and the south part of the island. And this is Eos Force Waterfall. Eos Force means waterfall in um, Gaelic. So it's so good, like New York, they named it twice. So this is Waterfall, Waterfall. And we always pop in here to look for Dipper and Grey Wagtail and just look at the look at the water just out of shot that just drops right off the side of Mull into the water. And there's a few people with some trombones um, uh, after eagles. So usually we um, Alexa has got it all mapped out where the eagles are breeding because we usually go in June and then you get a chance to see this. Uh, that's a, that's a sub-adult golden eagle because you can see from the white underwings and the white in the tail. And usually when you see eagles, they're always being harried or hassled by either ravens or buzzards, which is really helpful because sometimes just like the old Father Ted joke when he's explaining size and perception to to um to um the other uh I can't remember his name and he goes Dougal he goes Dougal this is a small cow and he's got a plastic cow and this that cow is far away pointing at a cow in a field because size is very hard to estimate is it a buzzard from a mile away or is it a golden eagle from three so when you see ravens chasing it which are the size of a buzzard and you see the eagle you suddenly realize they are flipping humongous um but I have to say, I do like golden eagles, but hen harriers are really good on mull. This is probably the most beautiful bird of prey for my money, which is the male hen harrier. We often see the ringtails as well. They're, they're sexually dimorphic. So the males are pearl grey with black wingtips like they've been dipped in ink and a white rump. And then the, and, and the females are brown with a white rump and they're often called ringtails. Um, we have fantastic short-eared owls. Um, this this summer on Mull, they were just brilliant. 
and I had them displaying. I've never seen them displaying before. So even I get a chance to see cool stuff. It was doing this kind of weird, uh, like almost like a Jack Russell bark, going right up high into the sky, doing this display flight. So I was absolutely thrilled to see that. So uh, certainly the last two years, we managed to catch up with short-eared owl there. In terms of small birds, um, I mean, it's not all about eagles and harriers and owls. I, I, my favourite small bird is probably the bullfinch. My second favourite small bird is the winchat. Um, and it's the best place to see. I never see winchat in Speyside, but we always get them on mull. And it's just a bobby dazzler of a bird. I just adore seeing winchat. You get a chance to see its scratchy little call. Uh, I think we had three of them. Um, of three si separate sightings last time we went. So yeah, really, really get excited when I see Winchat. Um, that's the land-based stuff. We obviously spend a couple of days out on the water. We'll go to the Shants. Sorry, we're not the Shants. We'll go to um, Treshnish Islands and we'll go on to Lunga, which is probably the best place to see seabirds and get close to them in Britain. That and Shetland and Skoma, I think, are the top three. Um, now we get over, we go over on a boat uh, from the from uh, Mull, and there's the, there's the little boat, and we go along this jetty, and we walk up, uh, and it's about a walk of about ten minutes to this massive big flat rock platform, where you get a chance. So you see seals on the way, but where you get a chance to see puffins. Um, those of you who've been on quite a few wildlife worldwide trips will recognise Alex Hyde there, who's a brilliant macro photographer and an absolute hoot to spend some time with. I mean, that's how close you are to puffins. I mean, you almost have to kind of slightly clear them off uh, 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 off the path in front of you. So if you want some puffin therapy, then it's got to be Mull or Shetland, frankly. Uh, you know, Seabird cliffs are more impressive than Shetland, but for closeness to the puffins, I'd go, I'd go for Mull. And the amazing thing is they're so close to us and the birds that are breeding here with loads of people walking up and down, have the highest productivity of any puffins on the island because we, us humans, keep the great black back gulls away and the bonkses, the great skewers, further away. So they actually really like us being there and they help, uh, and we help inadvertently ensure the puffins do really well. I mean, look at that gorgeous sea parrots um, or sea clowns. I mean, there's no other bird in this talk where I've got three pictures in a row of the same bird because you can't just get enough of puffins or maybe you can as so this is a lovely picture of a bridal guillemot so we get guillemots and razor bills and you, every now and again about 10 or 15 percent of them have this funny little white spectacle so exactly the same species but the further north you go you get more of the guillemots with these funny spectacle and no one quite knows why but um really lovely picture of a bridal guillemot a common bridal guillemot so as well as going over to Treshnish and on to Lunga, we always stop off to, um, to Staffa to go and see Fingal's Cave. So you can see Fingal's Cave here with amazing basalt common columns and the tufa on top. Um, and we usually, if it's calm, we'll take the boat straight in and nose into. And the captain always plays Mendelssohn's Fingal's Cave when we go into in nose first into the into the island um one of the favorite things that we do is our experience again up close and personal with white-tailed eagles um they do this amazing thing um uh see um uh, mull charters um out uh based out of um just you just had to craig new i've forgotten the name of it temporarily um where we go out we get an exclusive on the boat and the guys know where all the white-tailed eagle nests are and we get a chance to go and throw fish over the side. And the white-tailed eagles come down and grab them. So for the photographers, um, it's just seventh heaven. Uh, and quite often, you, I love seeing a white-tailed eagle from a mile away because I've found it and I'm really enjoying seeing it. But I also appreciate seeing it from 20 yards away. <laughs> and so what they're doing is they're, they're supplementing their food. The, the eagles find more than enough food to be able to, to feed their chicks. They're not reliant on the fish that are thrown overboard by mull charters. It just supplements them. I and mean, it gives people an opportunity. Here's some of the, some of the guys I know really well have been on a number of trips with me. Um, and they throw the fish over and the eagle is on the cliff watching. And then it comes in 
drops its drops its landing tackle, comes in like that, and you genuinely have the opportunity to take photographs like this. Um, sometimes when I'm with photographers, they go, "Oh, the bird's a bit far away. The bird's too far." Um, and then sometimes they're going, "It's too close. It's too close." And this is the occasion we get, "What lens do you think I need, Mike? Two hundred mil? No more than a two hundred mil, because the bird will be flipping close." So you get a chance to see them from 20 yards away. White-tailed eagle, nice adult, where it gets, takes six years to get that lovely uh, white tail. You can tell this is an old bird because it's got a very white head as well. And so some of these, the mull, Dave Sexton gives us a talk while we're there, who's Mr. RSPV mull, Mr. White-tailed eagle, tells us about the history of the project. And, um, uh, and some of these birds are living to 25, 30 years of age. So, um, uh, then we go over to Tobermory, uh, probably famous for being called Balamori. And what's the story of Balamori? Probably one of the most picturesque um, uh, seafronts anywhere in the British Isles. And from uh, Tobermory, we take a boat out. Uh, what we want then is a nice flat day because we're going for cetaceans, whales and dolphins. Um, to see really good stuff, we need it quite flat. Usually we get minky. Occasionally, we, usually we get uh, common dolphins as well. And very occasionally we get something even better. And we had one of the most amazing days this year. One of the best days I've ever had in shore cetacean watching. And these are all pictures taken by Alexa on the trip. We had common dolphins. We had really close minkies that were actually spy hopping. I've seen minkies 40, 50 times before, but I've never seen them actually sticking their nose out of the water. It's called Balanotris acutirostris or Balanoptera acute rostra, sharp nose, because they've got very sharp noses, it was sticking its sharp nose right up. And then we had humpback whale. We had one partial breach, uh, and this is the shot Alexa took. You, took. you can just about see where the white water is, that big white fin. They've got a big white band across their fin. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, it's minky, sorry. You can see the kind of big white uh, underside of their big pectoral bands there, big pectoral fins of the of the humpback. So seeing that was genuinely very, very exciting. So only, I think, the third or fourth time I've seen humpback in British waters. So thrilled with that. Anyway, there's Mull. I'm, time's clocking on, so I'm going to have to hit Shetland fairly hard. Um, it's, it's just going to the Northern Islands is always a treat. I mean, when you get to the Northern Islands, you are, so you get to the Northern Isles, which are Shetland, you are closer to the Arctic Circle than you are London. Sometimes it can be a bit of a swine to get there. Um, I'll tell you a story about, about why I got late there and what I missed when I was actually tour leading this summer. But if you want to see sea cliffs, if you want to have long summer evenings, if you want to go for unusual birds, if you want to get away from it, Shetland just ticks all those boxes. Um, this is a group, some of the same people actually on the same picture. This is a wildlife for wide trip um, uh, to Shetlands with, um, with one, of the, one of the local guides there. Uh, and um, we take 12 people there for the week and we usually have a brilliant time. Uh, one of the first things we do is go over to the island of, um, uh, I've temporarily forgotten the name, <laughs> I know it so well. It'll come to me in a minute or in three o'clock in the morning when I wake up. Um, but it's got this Iron Age, Musa. This is the Isle of Musa. And it's got this Iron Age Pictish brock on, which is the largest and, uh, and most extensive surviving brock in, in Britain. But also as well, it has uh, storm petrels coming in to breed in all the gaps in the stones. So we go there just after Simmerdin, which is the 21st of June, the longest day of the year. It gets dusky for a couple of hours. So we're generally out bird watching at midnight, waiting for the storm petrels to fly back in where they're breeding in the brock. And um, this is quite often the, the, the sight that we see with the sun gently setting for maybe an hour or two. It gets dark about midnight and it's light again about two o'clock. Right, at, right near the longest day. And this is just a bit of video that I shot when I was standing there watching the storm petrels. Randy, I'll just turn the sound off because I'm only talking rubbish on it. Um, you get a chance to see all these storm petrels flying, flying by your nose, which is a really hard bird to see anywhere, really. So, um, yeah, that's a, a great sight to see. 
So there we go. Um, storm petrels fly. You can lie down and see the storm petrels just flying over your head, like a motorway over your head. It's wonderful. So here's um, close to where we stay for the first three or four days. And you can see right at the southern tip of Shetland, somber ahead. I've um, got the most fabulous sea cliffs and you can see all this lovely pink uh, uh, thrift or sea pink in the foreground. So we'll certainly spend at least a day, day and a half exploring all around Sumbra Head. Um, puffins, you can't have too many puffins. There's like five puffin pictures. And obviously the seabird colonies are gorgeous. Um, I showed you guillemot earlier, we saw loads of guillemot here. Razorbill, the sea cliffs are really impressive. Um, and it's the best place in Britain to see bonk skewers. So this is the bonk sea or great skewer. Um, we saw good numbers last time we were there. This is one of the birds that really has been heavily impacted by bird flu because they eat a lot of dead birds or uh, their, their, their prey. They're kleptoparasitized, so they grab birds and, and steal the food that they've caught out of sea. So they've been very susceptible, but we should still see a good number and hopefully they're, they're bouncing back um, after going to a pretty low ebb. Uh, the sea cliffs are astonishing. Um, uh, it, it, don't go too close if you've got vertigo. <laughs> Uh, as one of our one of the guests over there just kind of waving to me i've just seen a nice job of puffin um so yeah just dramatic sea cliffs i mean the finest in, in britain really you can't beat them and in terms of humongous seabird colonies i mean they are the best in the world st kilda probably maybe scoma but shetland really is the place for huge seabird colonies uh, the gannets are so impressive just flying past with our two meter wingspan. And we go out on the boat and we go to Nos, where the most incredible sheer cliffs that are just plastered with tens of thousands of gannets. It's just an awe inspiring sight. And you're on the water in a boat looking at it. And one thing they do afterwards is they've got a bucket full of, um, of fish. And as they sail off, they, they put one fish at a time into the water. And the gannets are just diving all around us and they're flying behind the boat. So you can, you can just get, just fill your boots with amazing pictures of gannets. So one, you, one minute you see them on the cliffs and the next minute they're just diving like crazy around you. Uh, Tysters or black guillemots, so you'll clear up on all the British hawks. Um, so well, these are really common on Shetland. You can see them occasionally on Mull uh, and, and we usually get them on Speyside, usually in winter plumage. Uh, very rarely in breeding plumage, but there you can see the lovely black and white bird with their lovely red feet. And they've got a really red gape as well when they open their mouths. Super birds. Now, how are we do for time? I'm doing all right. Um, so inland in Shetland, um, I get red-throated diver on Speyside, usually only in winter plumage. I don't think there's any red-throated diver sites in Speyside. We very occasionally get them on Mull. But this is the place for a red-throated diver. I've always got them in winter plumage in Speyside. Um, but if you want to see them in summer plumage, come to Mull. It's got the, the red throat. You only really see that red-coloured throat when you get a really good view. Because it's actually kind of quite dark and chestnutty. They've got a red eye. But the way you always tell it from a distance is its bill is really snooty. So black-throated and great throated and great northern divers don't have a snooty bill. So if you see that kind of snooty bill like it's too good for us, that's the red throat. So um, we'd certainly be looking out for red throated divers on some of the Shetland lochans because it's probably the most important breeding site. Shet the Isles are the most important breeding site in Britain for red throats. Um, the bird is amongst us. There's only one bird they want to see that's top of the list. Red necked fowl, red necked fallow oak. Absolutely belting bird. We're talking one of our rarest breeding birds. Almost all the British population is on Shetland. There's one or two on the Outer Hebrides. Very occasionally you get them breeding elsewhere, but there's 20 or 30 pairs in Britain, and I would say 95% of them are on Shetland. And it's a polyandrous species, so the female is really showy, and the male is dull and dowdy. So this is a female, because the female is the one that, that rules the roost. Um, she courts the male, and the male will do all the incubating and will rear the young completely on his own. And the female redneck fallow may well then fly to Scandinavia, where summer comes later, to find a male Scandinavian redneck fallow to breed. 
So the females are only there for a short window. So um, yeah, just seeing red neck fallow oaks is probably the best bird on show. Yeah, because you just see, I mean, you just can't take your eyes off them. They're just little, little magnetic dollies going round. And, and we had great views of them last year. Um, it's not a curlew. This is a wimble. Another of those birds that we see on passage down south. I see them through the Somerset levels where I live uh, in spring and autumn. Um, but they breed up on Shetland. Lots of curlews breed there. But this is the rare one. And the curlew, of course, is bigger. And it's got the bigger, longer bill, and it does its curl, curl, or its bubbling call. Um, skewers. Oh god, they're just such gorgeous birds. This is an Arctic skewer, or as they call it in North America, a parasitic Jaeger. Um, so this is a pale phase one or pale morph one. You also get ones that are completely dark, but the pale ones are just stunningly beautiful. So these are kleptoparasites. They often chase puffins and guillemots and razorbills and fulmers out at sea to force them to drop their food and then they'll swoop down to grab it. So they are the pirates of the sea. So if the puffins are breeding well and the guillemots and the razorbills are having success, then the, uh, the, the, the uh, Arctic skewers are as well. So best place, Shetlands, Arctic skewer. Beautiful beaches as well. This is looking down onto a onto a grey seal and common seal uh, breeding um, breeding a colony. Uh, and one of the areas we go to on Shetland. So it's not just about the birds. We get a chance to see both species of seal. And everywhere you go uh, around Shetland, you see the sea swallows, the Arctic terns, loads of different breeding colonies of, of Arctic terns uh, were around. Um, this is a tombolo. So it's an island that's formed and at low tide, the island gets cut off. And then uh, at low tide, it forms this kind of umbilical cord across to the mainland. So we get a chance to walk over this at low tide and, and appreciate it. And um, anyone who knows, who spent some time with me knows I'm mad for plants. And this is a wonderful coastal plant that's really hard to find on mainland Britain called oyster plant. And if you take a little, it's rare, but if you take a little bit of the leaf, have a little nibble. It tastes just like oysters. This is a plant that's disappeared uh, from development along the coast, doesn't like being trampled, doesn't like being grazed. So it does really well on Shetland, but struggles elsewhere. Um, and this is probably my favorite guest picture. This is Keen of Haymar. This is the only place in Britain that is effectively a drop of Norwegian Arctic tundra. And that's perfectly natural. It looks like a car park or like it's been graveled over. And I go there every year with a guide and I want to see Shetland mouse ear. Um, it's endemic to Shetland. It's only found on the Keen of Haymar on one other site. And it's just stunning. Look at all the guests pointing. There it is. And it's growing on this amazing Arctic tundra. So I just, I mean, it's not, a, I, I know it's not an orca. I know it's not a puffin, but seeing something like that is just endemic, not just to Britain, but to Shetland, to two sites in Shetland. What a plant. Fantastic. So, um, I mean, in terms of diversity of, of going on cetaceans, in terms of diversity of cetaceans, um, Shetland can't compete with mole. Um, but you do get good numbers of harbour porpoise, plus also you get the big boy. So probably one week in two, we will get orcas. On, um, on Shetland, and it's the best place. It's the best chance of seeing them. So anyway, if you want to see orcas in the British waters, I know you can see them in Alaska, turn a penny, Antarctica, yeah, whatever. It's getting them on your British list is something exceptional. And so if you want to do that, get yourself to Shetland. Right, we're just going to quickly move on before I tire these patients. Um, I also, we're also doing the Festival of British Wildlife this year at the famous Agas site, west of the Great Glen. Uh, eating in quite possibly the most astonishing room you've ever had dinner. Um, this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, the whole site of, of Agas is run and set up and run by Sir John Lister Kay, who is the finest teller of anecdotes I have ever met. He just sits at that long table and holds court and tells just hilarious jokes about really famous people or funny guests he's had in the past. He is just the most wonderful human being and an astonishing naturalist. So, I mean, I just, I, I, when um, when Dan and Ian asked me to go up to Agas this year, I was like, 
uh, yeah, can we hang out with St. John? He's like, yeah, yeah. So I said, yeah, count me in just for hanging out with St. John, as well as all the wonderful guests. So you're really looking forward to seeing St. John. And this is the accommodation we stay at. Um, it's great atmosphere. So you can see there Nick Baker and there's Alex, Alex, the uh, macro photographer, Alex Hyde as well. So we do things like moth trapping. And then we have uh, lots of different opportunities for you to pick what you want to do. Do you want to do photography or do a macro day with Alex or want to do some inverts with Nick or want to go and look at some plants or some birds with me? You can pick and mix with whatever you want to do. So there's lots of options. for. It's a really sociable week. I really enjoyed it last time. And here we are at Agas get a chance to see the lovely red squirrels. Um, probably slightly more guaranteed to see Pine Martin, if I'm entirely honest. <laughs> Better than 50%, because if you miss them first night in the hides, uh, at Agas, you can go back until you flip and see them. Um, and there's the lovely loch they, uh, that they have at Agas. It's not just myself, people like myself and Nick and Alex that are there. All the local guides are, are really knowledgeable. So you can pick a mix between the wildlife or wine guests and the Agas guides. So you'll never be short of an expert on hand to help you out. Um, best place to see beavers. That's the Johnny Kingdom hide, named after the famous TV naturalist, good mate of mine that, that uh, died a few years ago, unfortunately. So you'll have a certain, uh, it's really looking for beavers. Go out in the morning or the evening. I usually do beaver watch because I just love sitting in the hide and just waiting for them to come out. Um, so uh, yeah, bring your long lens, sit there quietly and wait for the beavers to turn up. It's brilliant. And then you get, obviously, you get photographic masterclasses with people like Alex, as one of our favourite guests, Moira, doing some macro stuff with Alex. Um, doing Taking photographs of cool fungi, if you're into that. And then I go out on the boat and, and look for for things like uh, dolphins uh, in the Murray Coast. So, and then uh, I think last year, certainly, uh, they did a, um, a filming photography workshop. So you get a chance to um, kind of learn about your filming skills while you're there. Um, uh, so that's an opportunity. And then you just kind of get to hang out with people, do cool stuff, have a fun time, and just be really sociable. You can dip it, you can do as much as you want or dip out in the most wonderful surroundings. Um, just before I hand back to Ian, and I've spoken for one hour and one minute, uh, I just want to quickly mention something that myself and Ian, who, who spoke to uh, Ian Lloyd, the product manager, my boss, have been speaking to you about. Um, we've just set this up between ourselves. Uh, we're doing a South Coast Spectacular. So if you want to go to Scotland, great. If you want to stay a bit closer to home, we're just starting a new South Coast Spectacular that's coming in May. We launched it this week. We've already got, I think, six or seven guests out of 12. So it's, I mean, a week, it's it's over half full already and we've barely publicised it. So this is an opportunity to basically do a bit like Mull, have an exclusive experience um, and stay at this house. I think it's called Warmwell House. And this is where we explore the fantastic southern counties of Hampshire and Dorset. So we look at the kind of coastal, the estuary, the heathlands, and we get to do some really exclusive things that myself and Ian have been arranging over the last few weeks. So um, one of the things we do go is we go out to Dorset and have an experience looking at the Ospreys, which have just started to breed on the on the Dorset coast there. Uh, we'll get a talk on the, on, on the Ospreys. We'll get a chance to kind of go out and see them fishing. If we're, we're near the Isle of Wight, we'll also be looking for the white-tailed eagles, which are just about possibly going to breed in the next year or so. Uh, Roy Dennis's project with um, with Mark Constantine from Lush uh, to release uh, and, and repopulate the south coast with white-tailed eagles. I was there when the first white-tailed eagles came out of their cages. Roy Dennis uh, gave me an exclusive to film with uh, BBC's The One Show. So I was lucky enough to be there when the first six came out. So we'll get a chance to look for ospreys and white-tailed eagles down there. But also as well, what we've arranged with, um, I'm really good friends with Dave Waters, who is Mr. Bustard, the great Bustard. So we'll go up to the Salisbury Plains in Wiltshire. So we'll just dip a little bit out of Hampshire and Dorset, and we'll have an exclusive safari, going to look at the great Bustard's lacking. Um, Dave Waters will also take us round the safari, looking for things like stone curlews, uh, corn buntings, some of those classic farmland birds, which are really hard to see across large swathes of Britain. So if you want to have an exclusive 
looking at great busters, seeing displaying, talking to the man, Dave Waters, who knows more about busters than any man in Britain. Uh, Dave's coming out with us for the for the for the for the day. Then um, that's a really great thing to do. We'll also get a chance to spend loads of time on the Dorset Heathland. It's just a great time to go. In May, you get a look for Dartford warblers and lots of other really nice, nice little birds down there as well. So Radipole Lake and Arne and all these places will we'll get a chance to look for some of the some of the great southern heathland birds. Um, New Forest, we'll spend a day at the New Forest, hopefully looking for things like Firecrest, uh, listening out for Woodlark. Uh, we might just, if we're lucky, get to see Wild Gladioli, uh, which is one of the really famous plants of, of, of the New Forest uh, forest lawns. So I'm really looking forward to going to the New Forest and, and spending a day there. And one of the best things, of course, is going to the Heathlands. We've, ex uh, we've uh, secured an exclusive day out, uh, Creech, which is a fantastic heathland run by the Heptile, Heptile and Conservation Trust, run by Howard Inns and um, Terry Bagley. And they are spending a whole kind of half a day with us going round. We're going to join their survey where we hopefully will try to get bag all six species of reptile. So that is common lizard, smooth lizard, slow worm, breast snake, smooth snake and adder. Strange enough, add is quite tricky. Smooth snake, this is my boy looking at smooth snake. Uh, they will take us round and we'll get a chance. Thank you. They, Howard Inns probably is one of the Britain's experts on reptiles. Um, he's written books on, on, on um, amphibians and reptiles of Britain. And he's um, agreed to take us around for the day. Part of his survey work. So you're in the company of greatness. Not, with, not, not me, hanging out with people like Howard, Howard Inns, looking at the reptiles. So that will only be our group with Howard and Terry and nobody else. So that will be a fantastic day, which will be an exclusive we're really looking forward to. So we will fill our boots. I think that's it. I've slightly run over, Ian. I apologise for that. But I'm more than happy to take any questions about um, any, of the, any, any of the Scotland trips, uh, a little bit about, Ian can easily answer as much as I can about the South Coast Spectacular that the two of us have been working on. But um, I, you know, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've really encouraged you to kind of, you know, the great thing about going, so the Scotland trips and the British trips is people are being a bit more kind of judicious about their carbon miles these days. And I, I, I know, I, I know I go abroad. I go to Madagascar and I go to Ecuador with wildlife for a while. But a lot of people have said to me, I love to do one or two trips a year, but I like to balance that out uh, and, and do more trips at home and get to know Britain better. So I got lots of guests during COVID who couldn't go abroad, who came to, they kept saying, well, I was meant to be in Luanga Valley but I, I, I can't be there. So I've come to Speyside as well. And they just had a brilliant time. So um, lots of chances for you to kind of go, go see some stuff you've not seen before, but not go too far from home and explore the wonderful country of Scotland because I mean, it is my second home. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Mike. <clears throat> that was sensational. Um, you, you really brought each of those areas to life um, and, and just shows how different they all are, you know, not just in the, the different species you see, but how, how different the landscapes are and the, the experience that can be have, had in each of those areas. So, yeah, thank you so much. Ah, oh, you're welcome. I really enjoyed it. Good. Brilliant. Um, we've had some fantastic questions come in, um, but before we get cracking on those, I'll, I'll just um, launch our poll, um, which will give you an opportunity to download a travel plan for each of the trips Mike has um, just been talking us through. So just launch that now. Um, okay. Some panelists can't vote. It's a good job I don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to vote. No, there's a lot of choice there. So <clears throat> sorry. And thanks, Mike. Um, yes, we've had one question. Um, have you got a favourite place of all these wonderful sites um, in Scotland? I mean, my favourite place... Uh, that is, is going to Strathdurn, Fintorn, Valley of the Raptors. But I mean, in terms of my favourite destination out of Mull, Speyside or Shetland, I, I love them all. I, it's like trying to, if I had three children, I mean, what, if I had three children, I'd say, what's your favourite child? I couldn't do it. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're good for different things. Like, I love the exclusivity of Mull. 
And I, lo I love the day looking for cetaceans. And the food and knock house is just knocks your socks off. Knock house <laughs> knocks your socks off. I mean, Shetland, if you want to go kind of completely away from everything and you want to see great sea cliffs and, and brilliant seabirds and just have a really genuinely brilliant experience that's nothing like you've been before then, then Space Eye, then, then Shetland. But I think Space Eye, I know the best. And I think if you want to see a diversity of Scottish wildlife uh, and you want to kind of cover all those habitats. So you see the most species of bird at Space Eye because we're covering mountains, moorland, forest, lochans, coast, estuary. So, I mean, it, you know, if you want, depends on what you want to see, really. If you really, really want to see eagles and otters, mull. If you want to see a diversity of Scottish wildlife, then Space Eye. And if you want to just get away from it all and get a chance to see orcas, and um, amazing sea cliffs and fantastic sea colonies than, than Shetland. So I haven't answered that question at all, sorry. <laughs> that, that was really helpful, thanks very much. Um, another one that's just come in, it's, it's quite quick probably. Have you ever seen an all white squirrel at all? Um, no, I haven't. I, I've, I, I, we saw a partly albino blackbird, which is really weird when we were in Speyside uh, three weeks ago. And it was like black and white, like a magpie, because you see occasionally uh, magpies with, with white feathers. Um, but uh, I've never seen an all white. I've seen an all white albino brown hair, which was wow. one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen. And we filmed it for the one show. It was in the Clean Peninsula in North Wales. I think, you know, albinism is, is, in, is incredibly rare. Um, but obviously yeah. I see, see the mountain hares when they're looking white. <laughs> and I've seen one, a stoat that's gone white, or, or what they call an ermine, the famous Prince Charles or King Charles ermine. So I've only seen a stoat white once. But I've, I've, I've only really seen one properly albino animal, and that's the brown hare. And I've seen a few animals that are either leukistic, which is which is pale with a little bit of melanin, or partly al albinistic, where you get the funny white feathers. So yeah, I've never seen a, I've never seen a, an albino squirrel. I would love to. It sounds like one of the guests has got one in their back garden. Can I come and see it? <laughs> yeah, I don't, don't know, um, but um, yeah, it'd be great, great to hear more on that. Um, thanks. Another question: um, Are your trips? Um, this is from Helen Matthias. Are your trips mainly aimed at watchers, or are they really good for photographers too? Um, so thank you Alan, for the question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good one as well. I always say that, um, but you've got Nick Garbutt and Alex Hyde who are principally photographers. I, I take photographs, but I'm not a particularly good photographer. And I always state uh, with wildlife and wildlife that my trips are primarily wildlife watching trips, but I am more than happy to accommodate photographers, particularly on Mull when you want to get the white-tailed eagles. Um, so it, people have cameras all the time. Um, and I'm more than happy to kind of get people in the right place to get a really good picture of a red squirrel or crested tit is one of those birds that you can, with a bit of luck, if you get your line, if you get your line of sight right, you can get a really nice crested tit. But I, I don't spend forever waiting for the perfect shot. So wherever possible, I do accommodate photographers, but they are principally wildlife watching trips. But quite often I'll take, for example, on the, on the mole trips and the Shetland trips, it's 12 guests and two guides. On my space side trips, it's me and seven guests. Um, and I will always do my best to accommodate the photographers wherever possible, principally because they often send me the pictures afterwards and I can use their amazing pictures in the front cover of the report that I write afterwards. So I'm always kind of going like, oh yeah, nice picture. I like, can you send me a copy now? I'll use it for the report. And it's nice because they get to see their pictures on the report and I put their name on, say copyright Helen Matthews or whatever. So they can put their pictures forward um, but, you know, they only get used by me for that. But it's just really nice to have input from the guests to put pictures on, on the reports as well. So absolutely happy to accommodate photographers. But they are principally wildlife watching trips. So please bring your camera, but don't forget to bring your binoculars as well. Excellent. And that, that's, that's a great overview. Thanks, Mike. Um, and, and just to sort of add to that, yeah, we, we obviously have dedicated photography trips. You know, if, if you are looking for a trip that's more photography focused um so that you know these trips sort of are differentiated in that way so so i forgot to mention as well it was uh, the agas trip we had the lovely red squirrel that was neil um uh, neil aldridge so neil I, I think is coming to um, agas this year so neil runs a video workshop as well so i mean for those of you who are keen on moving images 
And Neil can give you some top tips on, you know, settings and, and how to edit and things like that. So lots of possibilities. Um, yeah, I'm happy to accommodate wherever. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Um, another one just on, <laughs> and this is going to be very challenging to answer, but um, sort of typical weather conditions um, in Mull, you know, sort of what, what kind of, what are the conditions like? Um, I have had my worst week and best week on. <laughs> this year was frankly astonishing. I mean, we had we didn't have a yeah. single raindrop. La uh, 2022 was more challenging. We had we I was there for three weeks. So I had one week where the guests were just needed gills, uh, and it was it was it was a tough week. But that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, but we can always find stuff. I mean, if it's you know, there's no no two ways about it. When it's when it's nice weather, the if it's raining, the eagles won't fly. Uh, the raptors just keep it keep um on the crags or in the heather so they won't fly but it's very very rare that it's raining all day um so we just pick our moments we have a stop for tea or coffee and then we wait till the weather clears up and quite often when the rain stops the wildlife kind of suddenly pops up and all of a sudden it's even even busier so i mean you can be very unlucky or you can be very unlucky but i would say that's five ten percent unlucky five ten percent very lucky usually it's 80 90 percent in between it's a cure it's egg. It's good in parts. We get some sunny days and we get some cloudy days or some rainy days. And what myself and Alexa are doing all the time is we've been trying to be as flexible as possible in one mull to make sure that certain days can accommodate the rain. And But if you're looking for birds of prey, you're going to wait until there's either a windy day for where there's lots of wind or create uplifts or the sun to create thermals. So we're constantly kind of chatting to each other to make sure that we kind of hit the right uh, the right location at the right weather so i mean it can be challenging but we you know we're always up for the challenge um but yeah if you're getting water or sunshine every day then you're gonna have an amazing week but you'll still have a flipping good week even if it's raining every day because we just we just have to work a bit harder <laughs> great stuff yeah add, add to the atmosphere um bit, bit, of, of, it does. bit of drizzle <laughs> <laughs> for example 2022 we used to use the dry room a lot I mean, the yeah. guests didn't even know where it was in 2023. <laughs> so, I mean, it is it is what it is. You kind of, I mean, you know, you pay some money, you take your chance in some respects. But, yeah, the the, the only thing guaranteed is that me and Alexa on Mull or, or or me and Dave Smith uh, up in Shetland or me on my own in, in, in space, I will strain every sinew and work as hard as we can to find as much stuff as we can. I, I challenge myself every year to try and see as many birds as possible on the trips. I mean, I, we, we just had 118 species, which is an astonishing record on Speyside this year. My oh, previous record was about 110. It's 118. It's amazing. We cleared up. We absolutely cleared up. So I've set that bar too high now. And they go, some <laughs> guests will go like, you've only seen 110. What's the matter with you? But yeah, I, just, I challenge myself every year to try and see as much as possible. And um, yeah, that way it's, that way it's good. Always pushing. Always pushing. Wonderful. I don't think you can beat a 10, 10 rap a day either. Um, I don't. Yeah, that was that was as good yeah. as it's ever been. I mean, we, yeah. at the end of the day, we thought we'd finished them, and we got we had eight, and then we went to Spay Dam, and we had Gosselk and Merlin. It's just astonishing. <laughs> yeah, ten rap a day. That was that was something else. Phenomenal. Great. Um, and just one more. Um, I know it's sort of hard to say as well, but sort of generally, the chance of seeing orca in Shetland. Um, I know you sort of said. I would say one and two, uh, 50%. Yes. Um, it's, um, there's Hugh Harrop up there. Hugh Hugh's our ground operator who works for wild, who works on behalf of Wildlife Worldwide. I mean, Hugh is Mr. Orca. There's probably no one who's got better knowledge. And Hugh's completely tapped into where all the orca sightings are. So he will be in touch with myself and Dave Smith. Um, uh, uh, what's Dave? Uh, uh, yeah, Dave Smith. Um, and he will kind of let us know. So we can... There's nowhere where we can't drive to. I mean, if we're looking at on somewhere ahead and and um, suddenly orcas turn up, we'll go for it. We'll just drop everything and go for it. So I'd say one week and two. First week we didn't see them, and then they turned up the day after we left. Thank you. And then this week, uh, that, so that's 2022, and then 2023 that the group saw them, but I didn't. So I mean, yeah, 50-50, I think. Is, but once we know that people are keen to go for orcas then we will absolutely, you know, just go for it at any chance and just keep our fingers crossed that they turn up. But it is the best place. 
Um, so we just got to just got to you know got to go there and just keep our fingers crossed. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Um, and just one more come in from Jackie Hobson. Um, are there good beaver sightings at Agus? Yeah, the beaver sightings are brilliant. Yeah, we're there, yeah. We're there in, in June, so they're long summer days. So what we tend to run is we tend to go into the Johnny Kingdom Hyde uh, early and late. The beavers are quite crepuscular. Um, so you, you're pretty guaranteed to see them. I mean, dawn or dusk. I love going. I love doing the beaver stuff. So I go in most times, taking guests in to, to look for the beavers. There's just something brilliant about seeing them. It's like floating logs. I mean, sometimes they're kind of 100 yards away uh, or 150 yards away. Sometimes they're much closer. I'll always take my scope in there as well so we can get really, really nice views. But it's just, a, it, it's just an amazing place to sit in that hide, looking across that loch. Um, and they are, effectively, they are captive beavers because they're in this huge, big enclosure. But it doesn't feel like it when you're seeing them or when you're seeing the, 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 the trees they've knocked down. So yeah, it, it, we'll see them well. I know you do a trip to Devon and you see them very well, don't you? So, I mean, if you don't want to go to Agash, you can go on Ian's trip to Devon and see them as well. So we've got all the beaver yeah. sites. <laughs> sites. Yeah. <laughs> sites sorted. Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, that's all the questions we've got uh, for this evening. So um, I just uh, mentioned that our next talk is with Brett Charman on Svalbard on the 5th of December. Um, and if you do have any more questions on any of these trips, please don't hesitate to get in touch and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, drop us an email and we can um, get back to you. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's all we've got time for this evening. So yeah, a, a, a big thanks to you, Mike. Um, thank you, that was yeah so inspirational and um, yeah, so insightful, um, really brought Scotland to life. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for giving uh, sharing your time uh, with me and Ian and uh, Wildlife for Wide and, and having a listen. I hope you enjoyed it and um, feel inspired to kind of to get up there at some point and enjoy the rest of the Zoom trips and wherever you're going uh, with Wildlife for Wide or, or wherever you're going with, whoever you're going with, hope you have a fantastic job. Keep enjoying wildlife and, 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 um, and stay passionate because wildlife watching is the best hobby in the world. It's official. <laughs> Nothing that can even compare to it. I know I'm singing for, I'm, I'm preaching the converted by saying that, but thank you for sharing your time with us. And um, I'll hope to see some or all of you out on trips at some point. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us. And um, yeah, have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.